an introduction to organic synthesis. That's going to be the topic in this first lesson on a whole chapter devoted to the subject of organic synthesis. Now, this is something you probably didn't visit in first semester organic chemistry, but it is going to be a major point of focus for most of you in second semester. In fact, many of you are going to consider this the hardest thing you're tasked with on most of the exams you see in second semester. So organic synthesis, there's no way around it. It really is a pain in the button. You can memorize all of the reactions and be able to predict the products for anything I throw at you, and you still may struggle with synthesis. And it's not just about knowing all the reactions, but it's about how you organize them in your head. And that's going to be a big point of focus for this entire chapter. It's not just knowing the reactions. I'm going to take that as a given that you guess you got to know your reactions. But we're going to work on really how you structure them in your head. In this first lesson, we're going to talk about some functional group conversions, how you convert one functional group into another functional group. So, and then we'll move on and talk about like how you make your carbon chain bigger or how you make your carbon chain smaller uh, or how you open up a ring because you're really limited in the number of ways you know how to do that both now and in the future. As we learn more reactions, we'll learn a couple more ways of doing those things, but not too many. But uh, this is going to get more complicated as the semester goes on. And so this is kind of like organic synthesis up till now. In every chapter where we cover a new functional group and learn a whole set of reactions for that functional group, we'll revisit organic synthesis in one little lesson and kind of have organic synthesis up till now. And we'll just keep updating it throughout this second semester. So what is an organic synthesis problem? Well, we're going to give you a starting material, starting material, and we're going to give you a final product and just say, how do you get from this starting material to this final product? Show me all the reagents and all the intermediates all along the way. And generally they're going to have somewhere in the ballpark of like two to five steps is pretty typical. Uh, and every once in a blue moon, you'll see one a little bit longer than that uh, for some harder classes and stuff like this and some professors that are more demanding, but pretty typical is anywhere from two to five steps. Uh, and again, you got to know your reagents really well, but you've got to have them organized in your head. And this first part is going to be just knowing how you convert one functional group into another. And we're going to cover five that involve reactions you've already learned up until now. And the first is, what if you start with an alkane? Well, you've learned very little about alkanes, and you've learned that the, pretty much the only thing you know how to do with an alkane is free radical halogenation and turn it into an alkyl halide. And you'll find out that much more commonly, we're going to use Br2 and do free radical bromination over free radical chlorination. Because if you do chlorination, you've got two different places where you could uh, you know, chlorinate this thing. You'd get one chloropropane and two chloropropane. You'd get a mixture of both. But with bromination being much more selective, you'll find out we use it much more commonly for synthesis purposes here because you get one major product. And we're going to put a bromine on that more substituted carbon. So substitution reaction, placing a hydrogen with a bromine like we learned in the last chapter here. So if you start with an alkane, this is nice because this is the only thing you know how to do with an alkane. So I mean, technically, you can do combustion or something like that, but it's not going to be helpful from a synthesis perspective. So if you're starting with an alkane, first step is going to be free radical halogenation. All right, so now we want to move on to a couple others. And if you start with an alkyl halide now, like as in like you just made one potentially, but if you've got an alkyl halide, you can possibly do elimination. So and E1 versus E2, you're probably going to be doing E2 almost exclusively. So E1 and SN1, we try to avoid those for synthesis because they almost always compete with each other. And it, there are a couple cases where maybe it could be used and stuff like that. But most of the time, we're just going to rely on E2 for elimination reactions and SN2 for substitution reactions in our synthesis. So in this case, we're going to do elimination with this guy. This is our tertiary halide here. And if we use a, a standard base here, so not a bulky one, but just a standard one like sodium hydroxide, or in our case, it's going to be sodium methoxide or sodium ethoxide would have worked as well. So nice classic strong base here. So then your Zaitsev product is going to be the major. And so in this case, here's our alpha carbon. So we've got beta carbons here, here, and here. And your most substituted ones are these guys, the one with the fused hydrogens. And that's what Mr. Zaitsev predicts where the major product should be. So there's our major product. So however, if we use a bulky base, So and oftentimes we'll use the potassium salt of our bulky base. And this is one way to write it. Another way you could write this is you could put CH3-3CO minus. And again, you'll more commonly see the potassium salt than the sodium salt, but either way. So a couple different ways you could see it written here. So with that bulky base now, you're going to go anti zaitsev or Hoffman. So, and you're going to form that alkene using deprotonating a hydrogen from the least substituted beta carbon. And so I'll form it between alpha and beta here instead. So total review of E2 elimination reactions from a few chapters ago. Cool. Now, what if you have a geminal or vicinal dihalide? If you've got two leaving groups here, 
we do in this case. Geminal means they're on uh, your two leaving groups, your two halogens are on the same carbon. Vicinal means they're on two adjacent carbons. Well, now with the appropriate strong base, you can actually do E2 elimination twice. And in that case, you'd form an alkyne. And you got to remember that for forming alkynes, since there's alkynes, you learned in the alkyne chapter that our new favorite strong base is NaNH2, and we're going to use excess of it. So it turns out we use excess because we got to do elimination more than once. We got to do it twice. And then once we form a terminal alkyne, we find out that NaNH2 promotes the formation of terminal alkynes so that it deprotonates it. So actually use three equivalents of NaNH2 along the way. And so because it deprotonates that terminal alkyne, you have to reprotonate it typically with a weak base like water. All right, either way, it doesn't matter if you start with a geminal dihalide or the vicinal dihalide, it goes through two rounds of elimination. And so instead of just forming one pi bond and getting an alkene, you form two pi bonds and get that alkyne. Cool, so these are both eliminations, just you have one leaving group, you could do it once, and you could form an alkene. If you got two leaving groups, well then you could do elimination twice and you can get the alkyne. So now we've got two more functional group conversions. We've got an alkyl halide to an alcohol. And uh, truth be told, we haven't actually learned a chapter on alcohols, but we're about to. The next chapter we'll cover, we'll cover a whole new set of reactions for alcohols. And so making an alcohol will be useful because after the next chapter, you'll be able to use them. So this is kind of uh, giving you a little foreshadowing of some reactions that'll be helpful very soon for organic synthesis. So if we start with an alkyl halide, and generally either a methyl or primary halide, uh, we'll learn here. So then we have the option of doing SN2. So if it were a secondary halide, E2 becomes more likely in most cases than SN2. And so it's not great, but for a methyl or primary, got a good shot at it here. And if I want to make an alcohol, well, then I want to replace the leaving group here with an OH. And so we should use a nice strong nucleophile, like a metal hydroxide, like NaOH. So in fact, I meant to write that in red. So let's go back and do that for the fun of it. Keep all my reagents in red here, be consistent. So and in this case, we'll just do backside attack. The hydroxide comes and attacks, kicks off the bromine. Classic SN2 makes an alcohol. Cool, so this is our first way to make an alcohol. And so, and probably not the most common one, truth be told, because like I said, it's not great for secondary alcohols and it doesn't work at all for tertiaries because they'll just do E2 elimination instead. So, but other way we can do this, we can turn an alkene into an alcohol as well. And you had three different hydration reactions. You had acid catalyzed hydration. So, and that's what we do here with H2SO4 and water. So it adds an H and an OH Markovnikov. It does go through a carbocation, was subject to rearrangements. In this case though, it's not gonna happen. We'd have a tertiary carbocation in anyways, not gonna rearrange. And so our result, our product in this case, is this guy. We add an H on that less substitute side and the OH on the more substitute side. Cool, now it turns out we have an alternative way to accomplish this, and that was the oxymercuration demercuration. So, and in this case, the only difference is that this one doesn't have the option to rearrange because it doesn't go through a carbocation intermediate. So in this example, there is no difference. They're gonna lead to the same major product. So, but there are certain situations, certain alkenes you might start with where a rearrangement might be feasible for H2SO4, but wouldn't happen with the oxymercuration demercuration. Now your other option is to go anti-Markovnikov with hydroboration oxidation. Cool, and this would be your product here. Here we've added the H on the more substitute side, we added the OH on the less substitute side, that's what makes it anti-Markovnikov. So, and suffice it to say, these are your major functional group conversions now. We got five of them, so we turned an alkane into an alkyl halide, we now turned alkyl halides, whether they be a single halide or a, a dihalide, into either alkenes or alkynes. And then we learned how to turn an alkyl halide into an alcohol or an alkene into an alcohol as well. And these are kind of the most common ones that are gonna be helpful to us. And if you realize these functional group interconversions, so this is the first step in kind of organizing the reactions. And as you learn more and more reactions throughout this semester, uh, you're gonna need to organize more and more and have these kind of functional group interconversions kind of organized in your head by functional group. So it is a little bit of a, ch a daunting challenge, but it is the kind of the way you wanna organize these reactions in your head. So now we wanna take a look at how we can actually change the length of your carbon chain. And we'll start by increasing the length of the carbon chain. And it turns out there's not a whole lot of ways we know how to do this. So if you're increasing the length of your carbon chain, that means you're forming a carbon-carbon bond. And we really just don't have a lot of ways to do this. We might have a half dozen in our arsenal by the time you finish off this entire semester. So people used to get, you know, Nobel prizes for coming up with creative ways to make carbon-carbon bonds. So, uh, but we don't have a lot of ways to do this. And so if you're looking at your starting material in an organic synthesis problem and your final product, and if the carbon chain gets bigger, well, then you know you've got 
one of a few different ways to accomplish this. And we'll find out that we really have one major way of doing this now, one more important way anyways, but we'll learn another one in the next chapter and a like I said, a, a handful of others throughout the course of the second semester, but really not that many ways. So cool. First one is actually going to be a very minor way, and that's simply by an SN2 reaction with sodium cyanide. So, uh, or potassium cyanide for that matter, just cyanide in general. If we do backside attack with a strong nucleophile cyanide here, it will add one additional carbon here. So in this case, we started off with a four carbon chain, and now we've got a one, two, three, four, five carbon chain. So, but we're pretty limited on this. We can add one additional carbon, done. That's all you can do. So from an alkyl halide to a nitrile in this case, so it is a functional interconversion, I guess, as well. You could look at it that way, but uh, more important is just increasing the carbon chain by one carbon. We'll learn later on in the semester that these nitriles here, we can do various things. We can convert them into carboxylic acids and things of this sort. But for now, we're kind of stopped. This is as far as we can take this from here. But again, it only makes us one additional carbon. And so it's not really that useful for kind of a, a variety of different carbon lengths and stuff like this. So if you want to actually increase the length of your carbon chain in a variety of ways, then you want to start with a terminal alkyne. And here I'm going to start with acetylene, but we could have a, a carbon chain on one of the sides. But in this case, we've got an SP uh, carbon on both sides, both of which are bonded to a hydrogen. And those can be deprotonated with NaNH2, we learned. So some of you might, might also learn that you can deprotonate a terminal alkyne with a Grignard reagent, but most of you probably don't even know what a Grignard reagent is yet. We'll learn about them in the next chapter. So, but for those of you that did, I just wanted to point that out real quick. But for most of us, it's really gonna be sodium amide here, NaNH2, used to deprotonate this terminal alkyne. You can deprotonate it on either side, but you can't deprotonate both sides at the same time. Once you've deprotonated one side, it becomes monumentally more difficult to deprotonate the other side. So, but we formed this lovely acetylide ion, and he's a strong nucleophile. And being a strong nucleophile, we could now react him with an electrophile of our, you know, our choosing to make the carbon chain longer. And so in this case, you've really got three different options. You, le you learned about one of them earlier, but the other two you may or may not have learned about in the alkyne chapter. So we're gonna explicitly cover them here as well. So the one you probably did learn about is just reacting this with like an alkyl halide. So let's just say uh, you want something that's either methyl or primary since we're about to do SN2. So in this case, we would just do backside attack, kick off the bromine, and attach one, two, three more carbons. So here's our, again, from our acetylide, and we want to attach three more carbons. So one, two, three, there's three carbons, and now we want to attach them. So when you're forming a carbon-carbon bond, it's often easy to make carbons disappear. So I highly recommend you count them. So we got two from this guy, one, two, and then one, two, three from this guy, one, two, three. And again, count your carbons, don't count your bonds. Cool, but there's our lovely result. And we now turned a two carbon chain that we started with now into five carbons. And the truth is, depending on the alkyl halide, as long as he was methyl or primary, so, well, methyl, I guess we'd only had one carbon, but if he's a primary halide, we can make it as long as we want to. And essentially we can make this as long as we want. We're not restricted to just like adding one carbon and one carbon only. We've got lots of options here. Now it turns out an alkyl halide in SN2 is not your only option. You can also react this guy with like a ketone or an aldehyde as well. So if we take a look at reacting this guy with an aldehyde, instead, we'll find out we've got to protonate it after the fact with some dilute H3O plus. And for whatever reason, we often don't write the word dilute. And sometimes we just use water, but we really need just a very slightly acidic solution, aqueous solution to accomplish what we need to here. So, but what's going to happen here is we're going to do attack on the carbonyl here is our electrophile. And so we don't have a leaving group per se, but this carbon is partially positive to a significant degree being double bonded to an oxygen. So, but he's already got a filled octet. So if we're going to attach a new bond to him, then we have to lose one. So, and that's the pi electrons push up to the oxygen, become a lone pair on that oxygen. And so in this case, you're going to end up with a single bond to your oxygen and a negative charge. And you'll now to this carbon have attached these three carbons. So I'm just going to draw that extra bond out there. So, and that's what we'd get. So, and this thing is called an alkoxide when you have that negative charge on oxygen. And that's why we add the dilute H3O plus. We're just going to protonate so that lovely species turning it into an alcohol.
Now, the truth is I've drawn this H in here only to be consistent, but for a hydrogen bonded to a carbon, the only time we generally draw those in is when they're the hydrogen of an aldehyde, but it's not an aldehyde anymore. So generally, you're probably not going to be drawing that H in. I'm just trying to be consistent. So we're not like, what happened to that H, chat? All right. So... If you look here, we made this bond right here. That's the new bond we created right here. So, and if you examine it, so this side over here was the nucleophile. This side over here is the electrophile. And you know it's the sp carbon of an alkyne that can be your nucleophile when it's an acetylide ion. And so when you look at the the carbon carbon bond you're making, if the carbon you're bonding to is bonded to an oxygen of an OH, well then you know that you attacked a ketone or an aldehyde. So whereas if the carbon you've bonded to, so in this case is not bonded to an oxygen and there's no oxygen nearby, well then you know you probably just attacked an alkyl halide. Well we've got one other option here, a third option. So, and that's going to be to attack an epoxide. An epoxide is a three-membered ring here with oxygen. And I'm going to put one more carbon on this just for the fun of it. And we'll finish this off with a little dilute H3O+. And once again, you can write water here or just H3O+. You don't have to actually write dilute in some cases. But the truth is we want an aqueous solution that is just slightly acidic to pull this off. All right, so when you've got an epoxide, your two carbons in your three-membered ring, that's what an epoxide is. So the, those two carbons are partially positive because they're both bonded to oxygen, and this ring strain makes them particularly good places to attack because it's going to open up this ring. We'll learn in the next chapter that it's called the ring opening of an epoxide. The whole class reactions with them, and they can react with a variety of nucleophiles, but the one of interest here is our acetylide again. And so it turns out when you look at the two carbons of the epoxide that are partially positive being bonded auction, you want to attack the less substituted one with your strong nucleophile here. So we're going to come and attack over here. And again, this carbon has two hydrogens that are not drawn in and you already had a filled octet. So if we're going to make a new bond there, one of them has to break and that's the bond to the oxygen. Cool. So that opens up that ring. And so that's actually the driving force in, in your ring opening up an epoxide is that you're relieving the ring strain by opening up that ring. So but let's see what this looks like here. So it turns out we are doing backside attack here, and that's why we attacked the less substituted side. And if we kind of draw this out here, this oxygen's now up here, our acetylide ion attached to this carbon, which and this carbon is this carbon. And so the acetylide is now attached to it. Cool, and we still have this guy over here. So notice this carbon doesn't get inverted. It's the one we attack that gets inverted, but it's not a chiral center, so we don't really notice the inversion. So, and then this auction by the H3O plus is also going to get protonated just like we did here. So in fact, maybe I should draw the steps to be consistent. Cool. And so in this case, we can see that final result. This is the carbon carbon bond we made. This side was the nucleophile. This side was the electrophile. So, and key thing you should recognize here is that the carbon we ended up bonded to on the electrophile is not bonded to an oxygen. So we didn't attack a ketone or an aldehyde like we did up here. That carbon was bonded to an oxygen. So, but in this case, there is an oxygen in the area. And so it's not to the carbon we bonded to on the electrophilic side, but to the next carbon over. And that's what happens when you attack an epoxide because the carbon you attach to that you attack loses this bond to oxygen, but the one right next to it will still have that bond to oxygen. And so when you're looking at a synthesis problem involved in increasing the length of your carbon chain, so oftentimes what you want to look at is you, you're going to look and say, okay, I probably did this through an acetylide, at least up through now. Next chapter, we'll learn one new method as well. But for now, it's through an acetylide ion. So here, and if what you attach to, there's no oxygens in the neighborhood, you attack an alkyl halide. If the carbon you attached two has an oxygen bonded to it, you, you attacked either a ketone or aldehyde. And if the carbon you attach to doesn't have an oxygen, but the one next to it does, well, then you attacked an epoxide. And that's one of the patterns you're going to want to recognize when you're increasing the length of your carbon chain. Okay, so now we want to look at decreasing the length of a carbon chain. And uh, this can happen to a couple of contexts. So either with an alkyne or an alkene, turns out we have a way of shortening the chain. And you guys learned ozonolysis. And so with a, a, an alkyne here, Analysis was carried out with ozone followed by water, but with your typical alkene, we got ozone and under oxidizing conditions with an alkene, we use hydrogen peroxide. 
Cool. Now with a terminal alkyne, you learned that oxidative cleavage here with ozonolysis can be that carbon-carbon bond. So, and you get carboxylic acid on both sides if it's internal. So, although if it's terminal though, then the terminal side becomes just carbon dioxide instead. So here we're going to have a one, two, three carbon carboxylic acid. Plus, we're going to get carbon dioxide from this side. Now, had this been a longer chain in an internal alkyne, well, then you would have just gotten two carboxylic acids. And if it was symmetrical, two, uh, two of the same carboxylic acid. So, but if it was asymmetrical, two different carboxylic acids. And with two different carboxylic acids, it's not so common to kind of go that route because then you got to purify and stuff. So, but real common to shorten your chain by just one carbon when you have a terminal alkyne through this process. Same thing can work with a terminal alkene as well. And once again, with ozonolysis under oxidizing conditions, you are going to cleave that carbon-carbon bond. So, and on this side, we're going to get a double bond to oxygen. And initially, this is going to form an aldehyde because we do have a hydrogen right here. And that hydrogen is still there, but under oxidizing conditions, aldehydes get oxidized to carboxylic acids. And so we're doing this under oxidizing conditions. So this is once again going to become a carboxylic acid. And just like in the case of a terminal alkyne, uh, with ozonolysis, with a terminal keen and ozonolysis under oxidizing conditions. So your single carbon on the other end also becomes carbon dioxide. And so in both cases, we've gone from one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four carbon chains and turned them into three carbon chains, carboxylic acids, but three carbon chains. We've decreased the length of the carbon chain by one in both cases. Now, not only can we use ozonolysis here, again, an example of oxidative cleavage to decrease the length of our carbon chain, we can also use it though to open a ring. All right, so we'll take a look at opening a ring here. And uh, in this case, with a, an alkene is what we'll look at. You're typically not gonna have an alkyne in a ring because those angles needing to be 180 on either side of the sp carbon, so not common. So technically, I guess it could happen with a very large ring, but you're not gonna be able to get a triple bond in a six-membered ring. So but with an alkene here, much more common to open up a ring. And we're gonna do ozonolysis again, but in this case, you might actually see it one of two ways, either under reducing conditions by using like dimethyl sulfide here, DMS for short, or zinc and water works for the second step as well. Uh, both of which are reducing agents, and those allow any aldehydes that are formed to stay aldehydes. But once again, we can also do this under oxidizing conditions, which causes any aldehydes that initially form to get oxidized to carboxylic acids. So, but in either case, you're going to do oxidative cleavage, and you're going to cleave that carbon-carbon double bond. And so in this case, perfect, you know, personally, I just like to predict my ozonolysis products by redrawing this, I'm gonna draw it really huge. Keep the carbon chain the same, but where you used to have a carbon-carbon double bond, erase it. And in its place, put two carbon-oxygen double bonds instead. So, and notice, we could draw this out as a big long chain because it's no longer actually a ring. These are not connected anymore. And so in this case, the top one here is a ketone. And if you form a ketone in ozonolysis, it's gonna remain a ketone. But this one is actually an aldehyde. There's a hydrogen right there. And if you do this under reducing conditions, like with dimethyl sulfide, sulfo ah, dimethyl sulfide, it's gonna stay an aldehyde. And so here we got one aldehyde on one end, ketone on the other. So, and this thing is no longer a ring. We could, you know, draw it out as a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, length chain. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's an aldehyde at one end and a ketone one in from the other end. So you could draw it like this as well. Now you could also do this ozonolysis under oxidizing conditions with hydrogen peroxide here. And it's gonna work the same way. And once again, I would draw this really big, leave my carbon chain alone, but where I had a carbon-carbon double bond, once again, draw two carbon oxygen double bonds instead. It's no longer a ring, but instead of getting an aldehyde like we have right here, under oxidizing conditions, that becomes a carboxylic acid. So our ketone still becomes a ketone. That's not gonna change. But any aldehydes that might initially form become carboxylic acids. And once again, it's no longer a ring and you might draw it out So we get an aldehyde at one end under reducing conditions, but under oxidizing conditions, that's now a carboxylic acid, but we still get this ketone in exactly the same location here. Cool. So only ways you currently know how to open up a ring 
and probably the only ones you're probably going to know <laughs> throughout this course. Now we'll learn how to form some rings later on in this course. And like I said, we're going to learn some more uh, functional group reactions all throughout the semester. And so the different functional group conversions and maybe how to form some carbon-carbon bonds make longer chains. Uh, we'll learn some additional ways for that, but like decreasing the length of a chain or opening up a ring, this is pretty much it. I don't think we're going to learn any additional ways uh, to accomplish this for the most part. So uh, I'll correct myself if I'm wrong somewhere along the way, but I can't think of anything offhand. All right, the rest of the lessons in this chapter, we're going to cover what I'm going to call common patterns in synthesis. So, and we'll just go through some common patterns and then we'll actually work some actual examples of organic synthesis problems so you can kind of get an idea of how they're worked. So, but for here, we've laid a pretty good foundation. We've already talked about functional group conversions for the ones that you know up until now. We've talked about how you make your carbon chain longer or shorter or how you open up a ring. And these are the tools you really need at a foundational level before we move on and start incorporating more functional groups in the future throughout this semester. Now, if you have found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the most helpful things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems, if you're looking for the study guides that go with this, if you're looking for practice final exams, anything of that sort, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.